Welcome. Um, today we're going to learn Pasha's Bay. But before we start, I would just like to uh, mention something. Um, the last couple of weeks I gave my email, Yaakov Yosef Reimann at Gmail, and I've had quite a bit of response. People have written from, uh, from Yishalayim, from London, from New York, and and um, I could see that they're like uh, you know very involved in it. They uh, they have uh, they could say with this vart you could answer another question, or they build on it, or they have different solutions. And this like is like um, there's like an active learning going on, which really what I'm trying to do. So I just want to mention a couple of, of emails that I got. So the first one I want to I want to mention uh, has to do with what we spoke about uh, about Basia's arm, whether um, it really got longer or if it was only figurative or literal. So uh, Matsyo Chaim Lawrence from London sent me this quote from uh, Rabbi Yerucham Levavis, the legendary Mashgiach of the Mir, uh, in Das Torah Shmois. Amat kuf ein ches. That's where it is. Das Torah Shema is kuf ein ches. Hine matzinu Amram al pasuk v'tishlach zamasa v'tikachel nishtavva amasa ames harbe. So we see uh, this is the Rashi that we mentioned. So he says like this. Hine roiv gasaseinu onu makshimem es hadover because of our great um, gasaseinu is. Um, um, Grobkeit, I mean Yiddish is Grobkeit, the lack of Edelkeit. In other words, not the uh, the insensitivity, the nuance. In a Soberoiv Gassaseinu, because of our Gassas, whatever it means by that, Onu Makshimim as we take it literally. Vdoimelon Kipshuta, it seems to us that this is actually what happened. Shemame Shitmatcha Yodav Alchad Makamateva, that her arm got longer and it went until the place where the Teva was, out in the river. Toysi Lachshavkein, it's a mistake. Afimamnam Nesu, it wasn't nice, he's saying, that I guess the nice was that, that she had this thought and that she went out there to get the Teva, which was really out of her comfort zone, and it was a nest that she wanted to do this. It's even a nest nigla. Even a nest like this works through Dakiya Teva, and to think that her arm extended, you know, for hundreds of amas or whatever, or however long it was, he says that is a mistake. And that's not what it means. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to mention this. Uh, others could say differently. Could be. Just wanted to say that on this. But we spoke in general how to look at Chazal if it's uh, if it's always literal or sometimes it's not literal. But uh, but uh, this is specifically for this question of Basia's arm. So this is from Rabbi Birochim. Okay, one more thing. Um, this is from Yaakov Feingold. He didn't tell me where he was. So this has to do with what we spoke about Vayechi, that I suggested that Yosef, when, when, when the Ephraim and Menashe uh, became Shvotim, then Yosef was demoted and he was no longer a Shevet. This is what it seemed to me from the Psukim, and that's why Yaakov felt obligated to uh, justify himself. So he sent me from the Kedusha Slavi, he says, Ki Yosef, einu ba shvotim k'ma yisharechav, that the Badich was saying that he was not like the shvotim, Menashe Ephraim heim nekroim shvotim, b'mekoimoi, Ephraim and Menashe became shvotim in the place of Yosef, v'yosef et tzadik nekroim ha'ovis lebonov, that he's, and he brings from Targum, he's from Daik and Targum, prishon ha'choyish, einu nekroim ba shvotim k'ma yisharechav, u'bonov heim nekroim shvotim b'mekoimoi, Prime of Nasha Shvatim. Okay, this is what I wanted to mention. Okay, these are Makairis and I appreciate them. Uh, okay, now one more thing uh, is that um, everyone wonders why why Maisha told them we're going to go out for three days into the desert and we're going to shech to Hashem for Hashem, like. Why is he saying this? You know, he wants to leave. He doesn't want to come back. So why is he saying this? And the truth is, 
then you'll notice that he never said he'll come back. He said, we're just going to go out three days into the desert. So why is he saying this? So I just want to give, I think, as a push to answer, that you see in, in Pasha Shemais, he says, We want to go to Shech three days in Midbar. Maybe we will be uh, wounded or struck by dever or by, by a sword. So Rashi says, He wasn't talking about that if you don't if you don't let us go, then we're going to get hurt. That's not what he meant. He meant you're going to get hurt. But, covered he spoke to, uh, to Paroi, he didn't want to tell him, if you don't let us go, you're going to get hurt. So he said that we're going to get hurt, but it was just a, a very diplomatic way of saying, you better do this or you're going to get hurt. That's what Rashi says in Pasha Shemais. Rashi also says this um, here in Pasha's boy, when he warns him about the mark of B'chayrus, says, V'yordu kol elai, they're all going to come, all your servants are going to come to me, and they're going to want us to leave. So Rashi says, He was just being diplomatic. Pari himself came. But he didn't say that Pari is going to come. He said, your Avodim are going to come. It was like a, a euphemism. He was saying that uh, you're going to come, but I'm saying your servants are going to come. So I think also that that when he says we're going to go three days into the desert, he's just speaking euphemistically. He's being diplomatic, the covered malchus. He doesn't want to end up tell Paroi, listen, you know, you have to send away your slaves, and that's it. That would maybe not be such covered malchus. So he says, you know, give us, let us go out for three days, and we'll shech and and. Pari understood what he meant, and he meant what he meant. He never said we're coming back. It was just a diplomatic way of saying it. You see, Kaseda is Cholokovod Machas. Even though Pari was such a Russia and such a... But still, still, he was a Melech Cholokovod Machas. Okay. Now, when Moshe says like this, um, by Chatzai, it's going to be the Makas B'chayrus, from Paris Bechor, who was uh, sitting on the throne, Ad Bechor Hashivcha Asher Achara Harechayim, the Bechor of, of a slave woman who is working on a millstone, they're pushing the millstone around and around, which this is a lowly Bechor. So from the prince is going to get killed all the way down to the, to the firstborn of Ashifcha, who is working by the millstone and, and pushing it around and around. That's what it says here. However, when the mak actually takes place, it says, He killed all the b'chayrim, Till the Bukhar who was sitting in prison. So here it says the Bukhar Ashivcha, and here it says Bukhar Ashvi. So it seems to be a contradiction. So the Mefarshim no, take note of this, and uh, Rabbeinu Bechayo, or Bachio, if you want to say, Rabbeinu, so Rabbeinu Bechayo says that it's really the same person, that the Bukhar Ashivcha. During the day, he was working by the Rechayim. At night, he was wor- he, went, he, went, he, he was in a prison cell. So, so when, when he told him the warning, that was during the day. So it says, Pcher At night, he was, he was in the prison. So it says, Pcher Okay, this is how he learns. But Rashi says like this. Rashi says, Pcher HaShvi, Pcher HaShivcha B'chlal the Pcher Shevcha is included in the Pcher Shevi. Why? Shreimonim and Achashav Shevukul and Adapachas. He started from the greater ones to the lower ones. The Pcher Shevcha Chashav me Pcher Shevi. The Pcher Shevcha is more Chashav than the Pcher Shevi. So when he says that Pcher Shevi, the Pcher Shevcha is also included. So the Pcher Shevi and the Pcher Shevcha obviously not the same person. 
and the Bechara Shivcha is a higher, a higher class. I mean, not the same, the lowest class is the Bechara Shvi, the, 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 you know, the one who's in prison. That's the lowest class. So you start from Paroi until the Bechara Shvi. So what happened before? Why wasn't the Bechara Shvi mentioned before? If it's not the same person, so, and, and Shvi is lower than Bechara Shivcha, so why wasn't he mentioned before? So, why is why was the Bechari Hashivcha killed? What, what, why was he responsible? So Rashi says, The Bechari Hashivcha also used to work with the Eden. Not only the, you know, the, uh, the, the other people, the, the higher classes of society, but even the Bechari Hashivcha also used to, uh, you know, oppress and exploit and persecute the Eden. Usmechem b'tzorosim, and they were happy. Why they were happy that they were that they were suffering? So why does Rashi say that they were happy? So could be that since they were avodim the bchar shivcha, so maybe that's what they were required to do. You know, they had no choice; they had to do this because that's what they were told to do. So then they wouldn't have been punished for that just because they were working with them. So that would not be enough. But since Smech and Bitzros and they were happy about what they were doing, that's why they were punished for being Meshabed in the Eden and forcing them to work. That's what, the, that's what Rashi says here. Now you look later, Bechar Ashvi, why is the Bechar Ashvi get killed? Because they were happy that the Eden was suffering. But they weren't working with them. They didn't work with them, they were just happy. So, the Bechar is um, because they were happy, they worked with them and they were happy about it. Bechar is just because they were happy, that's all. So, I, but they didn't work with them, so why did, they get, uh, why did they get punished? They didn't do anything. They were prisoners, they didn't do anything. So I want to say a shot like this, that, that they were in prison and they weren't doing anything. But they knew what was going on and they were happy about it. So, just by being happy about it, they, they are attaching themselves to the Egyptian oppressors of the Eden, and therefore they have to share their fate. They, you know, they, 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 they didn't do anything in sitting there, but they know that the, that the Eden are being forced to work, and backbreaking work, and they're suffering, and they're happy about it. So therefore, that means that they are like, they're, they're part of the team, they want, they're, they're rooting, you know, they're with them, they're with them. So, man, if you're with them, so when they get killed, you get killed too. However, let's say today they're, they're happy, and tomorrow they're not happy. They change their mind, they're not happy anymore. So when they change their mind, they're off the team, because they didn't do anything. They're only on the team because they were happy about it. So as long as they're happy about it, they're on the team. But once they're not happy about it anymore, they're not on the team. So everything goes by the way, the way they feel. So what goes by how they feel at the time of the Makkah. At the time of the Makkah, let's say they were happy about it the last week and yesterday, but when the Makkah happened, they were no longer happy about it. They did tshuva and they, they said, no, it's, a, it's, it's an injustice, you shouldn't be doing this to the Eden. At that point, if they're not happy, then they're not mishabrit to, to, to the Egyptians and then they don't deserve to die. The, the Bechayra Shevcha deserves to die because of what they did. And what they did, they, they, they forced them to work and they were happy about it. They deserve to die. It doesn't matter what they feel at the time of the Makkah's Bechayras. They did it, they deserve, for that they deserve to die. The Bechayra Shevi did nothing. He only deserves to die because, because he's, he's like a, you know, he's mishaber to the Egyptians because he's happy with what they're doing. Then it depends at the point of the Makkah. Were you happy at that point or not? If you were happy at that point, then you deserve to die. If at that point you're not happy anymore, at that point you said, no, 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 it's no good, I'm against it, I'm against it, and you never did anything, so then you don't deserve to die. So when the Maka was given, he said, Abcha he couldn't say, Abcha because we don't know what is going to be the attitude of Abcha when the Maka comes. Will he be happy at that moment? Will he not be happy? We don't know. 
So you can't tell him that the Bukhara Shvi is going to die. It's not determined yet. Maybe he will die, maybe it won't die. It depends on, on what, he, what, what his attitude is at the time that the Makkah comes. So you can't say that. But when the Makkah came and the Bukhara Shvi was happy, then the Bukhara Shvi also was killed. So that's how I want to resolve these two psukim according to Rashi. Okay, now, at the end of the parsha. So this is the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. So this is the mitzvah that then Leil Seder with Mekayim on uh, Magid. Magid is when kind of the mitzvah of Vigadol Bincha, and we're telling the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and that's what we're Mekayim this. So, I want to... Magid starts with a preamble, a very puzzling preamble. We come home from shul, we make kiddush, we set up the kara, we lock the door first of all, make sure it's locked, double bolted, put on the chain, lock the door, set up the kara, make kiddush, and now we do we do um, we do yachatz, we do ruchatz, karpas, yachatz. We break the matzah, and now starts magid, and we take the prusa, and we say, "Ho lachma anyo diachol avasona ba'ar de mitzrayim." This is the bread of our affliction that our that our ancestors ate mitzrayim. Kol dechvin yeisiv v'yeicho. I want to take it one at a time, just read the whole thing. Whoever is hungry should come and eat. Whoever needs should come and share in the Pesach, I guess. Now we're here. Now we're here, next year we'll be in Eretz Yisrael. Now we're Avodim, next year we'll be Bnei Chayr, we'll be free. So let's start with this, uh, the first thing. Whoever is hungry should come and eat. I mean, what kind of an invitation is this? You came home, you locked the door, you made Kiddush, you started the Seder, and now you're inviting people? Whom are you inviting? You're inviting your children? I mean, whom are you inviting to the, to the Seder? What does that mean? What's the next thing we say? Whoever needs should come what and share in the carbon pesach that's not true carbon pesach could only be eaten by people you have to sign up for a chabura before the shechitim during the day you have to sign up and then you can eat it you can't invite somebody to eat from the carbon pesach it's not allowed to so what is called the shechitim of the yivsach my father shall talk about this thing called the shechitim of the yivsach then we say hashata hocha now we're here, next year we'll be in Eretz Yisrael. This is not our Nusach. What do we say? We say, That's the Nusach that we say. We talk about, we're looking forward to the future. At the end of the Seder we say, What kind of a language is this? Next year we'll be in Eretz Yisrael. Where do we ever find such a language? We never find such a language. Why do they say, Say, and then you say, Hoshata Avdi, Lashonabob Nechayrim. Now we're Avodim. Next year, we're going to be free. We're not slaves. I mean, we are oppressed, we're persecuted, we're murdered, we're exiled. exiled. I mean, we have a difficult time, true. But we're not Avodim as a nation. After Mitzrayim, we were never enslaved as a nation. Even like, uh, I mean, the Romans took some people and enslaved them, sold them into slavery. But Kali Yisrael as a nation was, was, was never enslaved anymore after, after Mitzrayim. When, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar took us, we were exiled. We were exiled. We were not slaves. We lived in Bavel. When, when, when are we slaves? Are we slaves? Why are we saying? It could mean in the figurative sense, maybe Avdi, we're not really. But, it's, but Lamaise, we're not Avodim. 
We're not a vodim. Shatadli, the Shonavod, next year we're going to be free. We are free. I mean, uh, we suffer in our freedom, but we are free. And then, final question. We say this, this preamble, this paragraph, we say it in Aramaic. Why do we say it in Aramaic? Because we don't want the Molochim to understand it. Why do we say it in Aramaic? The entire God that we say in Lashon Kaidish. This is the only paragraph in the entire God that we say in Aramaic. Why do we say this in Aramaic? So I'd like to suggest um, what, this, what this is about. Now, I, I, was, I was born after the Holocaust. But when I was growing up, the Holocaust was very real to me. First of all, my father's whole family was killed in the Holocaust. And, and as I was growing up, I met people that had been there, that had been in Auschwitz, that had been refugees, that was starving or in Siberia. I, I met people that, that, that had suffered through the Holocaust. So the Holocaust is very real to me. But let's imagine for a moment, I mean, it's happening already today, but let's push it into the future. Let's say a hundred years from now. Somebody wants to tell his children that, you know, my great, 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 great grandfather from 150 years ago or 200 years ago, he was in Auschwitz and he survived, he survived Auschwitz. And tell them how they suffered. And the children are listening to the story about their ancestor from uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and they're listening, and they don't relate to it. They don't connect to it. It's not, they don't, there's no emotional connection to this. But let's say that this father has in his attic um, the pajamas that his ancestor wore in Auschwitz. And he says, you know what, wait a minute. And he goes up to the attic and he brings down the, these pajamas and he shows them the striped pajamas. This is what he wore when he was in Auschwitz. And it's, you see it's like blood-stained and sweat-stained and, and ragged. And they look at this and then the, the, the ancestor that he's talking about comes to life. He's a real person. This is what he wore. He's a real person. You know, when I was in, I was in London once, and I visited my cousin, Rav Khuna Halpern, of whose mother, my grandmother, was sisters. And he tells me that, that, that he had a becher. And he says, this becher belonged to Rabbi from Mishlana. And he says, you want that? I said, I'll make a bracha on it. So he gave me some orange juice in the becher, and I made a bracha, and I drank from it. I managed, like I never felt like so connected to Rabbi Primishlana. I was drinking from the cup that he himself, that his holy mouth drank from it. And it's like, it, it's you no, know, I, you know, I knew about Rabbi Primishlana, of course, but it became very real to me. This is, he held his cup in his hands. That's a, an artifact, has the ability to bring something to life, to bring a person to life. So if you had, if this father had the artifact of the pajamas that this ancestor wore in Auschwitz, and he was able to show this to the children, that this is what their ancestor wore on his body, and this is his blood stains, and this is his sweat stains, and the, the, the person becomes a real person, and this is their grandfather, so they would have an emotional connection to this person. And then when the father tells them about the suffering that this person went through, then they will feel they will feel the sympathy and they'll feel the, the they'll share the pain and they will cry maybe. But this was this is this is all accomplished with an artifact. Without an artifact, it's very difficult to accomplish something like this. Now when we're talking about the Gula from Mitzrayim, we also have to understand that that it was a tr terrible human tragedy that our ancestors went through in Mitzrayim. And to appreciate the Geula, we have to appreciate the Shibud. We have to appreciate the suffering, and we have to, we have to somehow connect to these people. And not just like some abstract ancestors that lived a few thousand years ago, and like, where, where's the connection? How do, we, how do we share their pain? How do we share their pain? They're not real to us. They're just like, you know, the Zaydis and Mitzrayim, but like, how do we make them real? How do we make them, how do we bring them to life? 
So we don't have any artifact. We don't have the clothing that they wore. But we have a facsimile of their distinctive food. This prusa, this piece of matzah, this is the lechem of Avdus. It's not the lechem, this lachma anya, this is what Farshim will say, is the lechem of Avdus. This is not the matzah that they carried them from when they, they didn't have a chance to bake their bread. This is the matzah that when they worked and they had a break in the work to be able to eat something, this is what they ate. They had a piece of broken matzah and this is what they ate. So we have, we don't have an artifact, we have a facsimile of an artifact, which is the next best thing. So you take a look at this matzah. You don't see such a matzah normally. This matzah is the matzah that our grandfathers ate when they were in Mitzrayim. And the rest of the paragraph is in quotations. The system of the Gemara, the system is the system of, of Shas, of Liver Chazal, is not like we have, like in, you know, he said, comma, open quotations, that. No, the Gemara goes straight into it. The Gemara gives you the system, and you have to understand that this is being a, this is a quotation. It doesn't always say, Omar Cain. It sometimes it just tells you what, tells you the thing and tells you the quotation. So this is, the rest of the paragraph is a quotation. So now we have, we have our, our ancestor, and we have a kind of facsimile of his food, and now we're going to tell you what he was like. What it was he like? He was, he was working hard, he had a break, he had only this little piece of matzah, and what did he do? What did he say? He said, whoever is hungry could come and share this piece of matzah with me. No matter, even though they were avodim, and they were, they were, they were oppressed, and they were beaten, but he was still generous to each other. They still said, I have a piece of matzah. If you're hungry, I'm willing to share my poor lachma anya. I'm willing to share this with you. If you're hungry, come, I'll give you some of it. Called it Tzrich Yesev Yifsach. Rashi says in, in Boy that, that what does the word Pesach mean? Pesach in, 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 in Aramish is Loshem Pesiyo, a step. So call the Tzrich Yesev Yifsach. Whoever needs something could step in here and I will be there to help you no matter what you need. This is the Avodim. This is the beaten Avodim. He's saying, I'm willing to share my, my, my morsel with you. I, whatever you need, I'm willing to help you. L'shona habo ba'arad Yisrael. They had hope. But what was their hope? They could go to Yerushalayim. There was no Yerushalayim. We're quoting them. We're quoting them what they said. They said next year we'll come back to the land of the Eden. We'll go back to Canaan where we come, came from. L'shon Abba Ba'ar Yisrael. We're going to go back to the land of Eden. We won't be here in this land of the Egyptians. Ashata Avdi. Now we're Avodim. They were Avodim. L'shon Abba next year we will be free. So now we've painted an image of this of, of this ancestor for the children, for the people who are sitting by the Seder. We've told them this is the facsimile of their food. This is what they were. They were generous and they were helpful and they never lost hope. And even though they were oppressed, they still had hope that one day they would be free. This is what the what Allah Ma'anya does. Now this is what this is how we start the Seder. Bring the bring our ancestors to life. When you bring them to life, then you could appreciate the Shibud, and then you could appreciate the Geula. If you don't bring them to life, then it's just, it's all abstract, it's all theoretical. It's not something to which we can relate at an emotional level, which we can really appreciate. So why is it in Aramaic? So the, when they wrote, when they wrote the Haggadah, the language, Taisus Rid says, when they wrote the Haggadah, They wrote the Haggadah at that time. Where's the Taisus Rid here? He says, "Msap Maramis l'chem msap Loshan Zeh." That 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 when they wrote the Haggadah, people spoke Aramaic. People didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't speak other languages. Even though all the Yidden they spoke Aramaic, just like in America today, most Yidden speak English, not uh, Hebrew or Yiddish. I mean some, but uh, but that was the language. The language of Eretz was. Aramaic. So when they wrote the Haggadah, they wrote this paragraph in Aramaic. Because this is critical. This you have to understand. 
You have to understand, because without this, you're not going to relate to the people that we're talking about. But you're talking about the rest of the God, the Lashon Kodesh, so you're, you, maybe your grasp of Lashon Kodesh is not that great, and maybe some things you understand better, and some things you won't understand so well. It's okay. But this paragraph, this paragraph, you must understand. You must understand, and because without this, you will never have an emotional connection. You're never going to r- r- regard our ancestors as, as our Babas and Zaydas, the ones that we know, even though these we don't know, but you're not going to have that connection to them as your, your, your living ancestors of whom you really, you really care about them and you feel their pain. So some, when I speak about this sometimes, people say maybe today we should say it in English. And according to the Taisis Rid, that says that the reason why we say it in Aramaic is because people understand it, so maybe we should say it in English. All right, I'm not going to get involved with that, but this is what I think that this paragraph means. I would like to conclude with a riddle that I'd like to ask. Uh, I ask people this riddle a lot, and uh, usually they don't know the answer. Um, the bunch of the Seisi, I'll take them out of Mitzrayim. What was the actual act of taking them out of Mitzrayim? There were ten makas. The first nine makas didn't work. The tenth maka worked, makas b'chayres. So was the act of taking them out of Mitzrayim, when he says v'hoitseisi, I'm going to take them out, does that mean with makas b'chayres? Or does it mean with the entire ten makas as one set, they're all one process, one ongoing process. So when he says, I'll take you out of Mitzrayim, it means with all ten makas. Well, no. It doesn't mean all ten makas. Those were preliminary, so I say, to, to show the Rukhayach of the Rabbah Shalom of the world. But the actual Haitzaisi was only with makas b'chayrus. This is a riddle that I'd like to ask. Maybe I should pause for five seconds to give you a chance. But anyway, <laughs> so the answer is, I think, that it's Machlekes Tanoim. Where is Machlekes Tanoim? It's in the Haggadah. It says, Vayetzienu Hashem in Mitzrayim. The God that we talk about, Vayetzienu Hashem in Mitzrayim, because this is a Pesukim in Kisove, which gives you, you know, uh, um, you know a, a, a brief account of the... The whole God is based on, on the on the um, vidui of Bikurim, because over there you have like, you have like um, a short account of the Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim, they go through all the pieces. So we say, Vayitzeinu Hashem in Mitzrayim, so we say, Lo yodei malach, lo yodei sorov, kash baruch ba'as mo'ay v'arte b'at Zrayim, v'yikein si kol b'chor b'at Zrayim, he says that this is, uh, this is, b'akaz b'chayris, v'yikein si kol b'chor b'at Zrayim, then it says, v'yot chazoka, v'yot chazoka, so a dever, Makas B'chayrus, was a dever. It was a pestilence. They all died. It was an epidemic. B'zorayin Atuya, zo acherev. What's the cherev? The cherev was the revolt. The B'chayrim, they all say, the, 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 the B'chayrim revolted. They said, here, we're all going to die. So they revolted. And for one day, there was a civil war in, in, in Mitzrayim. So B'zorayin Atuya means zo acherev. B'yoysoy z'amata. And Moses and Adam, there was bloodshed, you know, because it's all, it's all talking about Makas Bechayrus. So it's Makas Bechayrus. Says the Balagod, the Dovarachar, Biyot Chazok Ashtayim, Ebizorin Tui Ashtayim, Ebmoyagod Ashtayim, Boys Ashtayim, Moses and Ashtayim, Elu Eser Makas. This Pasuk is talking about all ten Makas. So the Tanakhama says that this Pasuk is talking about Makas Bechayrus. And the Tanakhama says, that is talking about all ten makas. The Yitzhienu is referring to all ten makas. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next week.